Well, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Garrett Schmidt, and I am the managing editor for BBC Exhibit Hall. And I'd like to welcome you all to today's live webinar hosted by Propeller Health, and it is called Leveraging Digital Health to Improve Quality Metrics That Matter. And I uh, had the honor of having a little sneak preview of what was going to be discussed, and I think that there's going to be some exciting things. So I'm glad you guys are with us uh, today. Uh, a few items of note before we get started. This is, as usual, a uh, traditional webinar format, so we can't see you or hear you, uh, so no need to mute your mic or anything like that. Um, but uh, we do want to hear from you, and so we're going to have a time for Q&A towards the end of the presentation, uh, so you will ask, we'll be able to answer your questions. Um, that said, if you do have a question at any time, Go ahead and submit that using your control module and there's a little questions uh, tab on there so go ahead and submit it there and uh, we'll get to that during the q a if we don't get to yours for some reason if we run out of time or whatnot someone will get back to you via email to answer your question so even if we're wrapping up at the very last second go ahead and submit your question and we'll get to it um and then finally the session today is being recorded so uh after Afterwards, uh, I'm going to send you all a link to the recording, as well as where you can get the slides. Uh, I know that's a big question is, uh, are the slides available? Yes, they are. Uh, what you'll do is you'll follow that link to the recording and there'll be a, a button where you can uh, download and view the slides there. So without further ado, I wanted to briefly introduce our speakers today. We have uh, Ms. Tracy Chu, who is a corporate uh, vice president of population health and the Chief Executive of the ACO at Scripps Health. And we also have Susan Monticelli, and she's the General Manager at Propeller Health. So excited to hear from you guys today. Welcome. Thank, Thank you so much. Um, so kind of as an opening, um, we wanted to really kind of set the context together with Tracy for the, for the conversation. And we really thought about you know, what is it that we want to measure that digital health could have an impact on? And we really found that these five metrics are really kind of a quintuple aim uh, of, of what we try to achieve when we launch a digital health program as an ingredient of the overall health care that we're providing to our patients. And so what we have today is two different perspectives. Uh, we are currently not working with scripts, but we are um, both very passionate about wanting to lift up and accelerate the adoption of digital health. And so from my viewpoint, this is my third digital health company that I have the privilege of being a part of and leading. And prior to that, I spent 10 years on the payer side of the equation. So some of my perspectives will get colored by, by all of that experience in our conversation. So if we go to the next slide. This to me is interesting because a lot of digital health and what we see doing today, whether we're looking at it even from a wellness perspective or true digital health and therapeutic perspective, it's really a companion or an ingredient to having insight to patients and being able to connect the patients to care outside of the facilities, the traditional facilities of where we offer care to our patients. And those insights really help I think on multiple different levels. They help on the patient level um, and then their motivations, but they also start to provide insights and real ease in having visibility to how somebody may be taking their medications, for example, or, or be able to prioritize patients for a provider who may or may, um, based on kind of what their risk profile looks like, um, based on those insights coming from, uh, from a digital therapeutic. So, these are some of the interesting elements that we'll dig into in the next few pages. If we go to the next slide. Just a tiny bit on Propeller. I, I won't spend too much time on this, but essentially we help to bring proprietary hardware devices together with a, that are FDA uh, regulated along with the software that's FDA approved. And then we combine that with supplemental coaching and uh, as well as then have access to a physician portal, either through an HR or through a web-based portal that provides those insights to providers. And so when I talk about kind of the digital health solution, these are the ingredients that we're bringing together to bear from a propeller health perspective. They're also similar to some of the ways that, um, as I work both in sleep and in the diabetes space, that we've done similar combinations in the digital health space of, of hardware, software, as well as caregivers um, and, and supporting provider practices. So if we go to the next slide, 
When we think about quality measures, and this is obviously not a comprehensive list of all of the quality measures, but we wanted to be specific about thinking about it, whether it's from an asthma and COPD perspective, but also from a preventative screening perspective and cardiovascular and diabetes, which Tracy will talk to in a, in a few minutes. These are really the ways that we can think about impacting and have some concrete examples around the type of difference that we can make in the market. And so often we think about the HEDIS measures in particular or and how that translates into real outcomes if we think about emergency department utilization, especially, for example, in the case of asthma patients, um, being able or COPD patients, being able to reduce those emergency, uh, emergency room visits through better quality care, better medication adherence, um, and being able to address when for example, patients are starting to use their rescue medications more frequently, um, being able to raise them to the level and intervene prior to an emergency room visit is really important. So if we go to the next slide, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking really about kind of the types of results that we've seen on the propeller side. And this is really back to those kind of that quintuple punch that we were talking about earlier in terms of what can a digital therapeutic help uh, impact. For us, we kind of start with those quality measures. So I was just talking about the emergency department and what we've actually seen um, with our patients and our, and our um, clients, what we've been able to achieve together. And I think the important highlight here is together. It's not just about throwing a digital solution out there into the marketplace and hoping that somehow magically the patients are gonna engage with it and that the providers are magically gonna have fully uh, compliant patients, but rather it's, a, it's an ingredient and it's a lubricant that helps the communications between the patients and their clinicians, both in making better decisions around the medications, but also being able to identify when a patient might need additional support to be successful. So we saw a 57% reduction in asthma-related emergency room visits. And similarly, for in the COPD area, we saw a 45% decline in related emergency department visits and hospitalizations. Those are pretty large numbers. And we, um, we have been able to really think about the entire experience for those patients from beginning to end. Because these metrics, when you look at those emergency room visits, they not only impact the utilization within the hospital systems, but they also impact the care experiences that those patients are having and the real lives and of those, um, those families and the caregivers of these patients as well at home. When we think about um, medication ratio increases, this has been something that we've seen a lot with our patients. Um, that's challenging is to stay on top of those controllers because it's it's tempting to think of your controller medications in asthma and COPD kind of like Advil, where you're hurting, you take your Advil. Once the pain goes away, you can stop taking the Advil. And in this case, being able to be compliant with those controller medications is really important when we also then think about how often does somebody need to start to use their rescue medication. And so this is one of the key measures that we look at from that quality perspective. Um, from some of these other metrics, when we think about the clinician and patient experiences, engagement is really big. And this is a real part, what we've learned at, at Propeller is that this is a partnership with, um, with the patient and their provider. And when both the patient and the provider are using these digital health tools, we see a really high level of engagement with the patients and, and that sustained engagement most of all. And so when you're introducing a digital therapeutic like this into, um, into the care journey of a patient, it's really important to think about what is the role of that provider and what's the expected role of the, the patient and how does that collaboration work together? Because that's where we start to see some of this, this sustained engagement happen. For us, the propeller equity is a, is a really big, big topic of conversation. And we think about some of the harder to reach populations and how can we best support them. And we found that with digital therapeutics, we've been able to make a pretty significant change in terms of gaining higher adherence, even within these harder to reach populations. And it goes back to that collaboration between the patient and the provider and how these digital tools, especially when they're passive and they don't require the patient doing anything extra, how those tools can get adopted. 
And finally, kind of on the clinical and the financial side, looking at those overall adherence numbers and looking at the rescue inhaler use, as I mentioned before, these are really large improvements that you can take and complement that existing care environment for that patient. For financial results, we tend to look at them in many different ways, whether you just kind of look at it as utilization or whether you look at it more broadly. We've shared just some numbers here when it comes to that overall um, resource utilization for these patients. And we've seen some really significant cost savings um, that have impacted, um, impacted the, the clients that we've worked with in the past. But it is interesting and, you know, obviously many of these patients have very different types of insur insurances and it's difficult to do a full calculation on the impact to the patient as well. But when we look at these numbers, we recognize that there's an impact to these patients and their financials and their families' financials, whether it's through more indirect ways of missing days at work or whether it's through having to provide um, coverage for those medication bills. So we kind of tend to want to constantly look at this whole equation on um, what it means for the patient first and foremost, and then how does it impact um, our providers and our provider workflows? And then how do we think about the financials um, as we think about um, the care and obviously not to leave behind the quality and the equity pieces. So these are kind of the five things that we at Propeller have been focusing on. If we go to the next slide, I wanted to just do a quick reflection um, because I find that it's really hard to think about the impact of digital health without acknowledging where we are in this journey. And, and this is part of the reason I think Tracy and I connected is that we both feel like there's so much more opportunity here. And when we started to look at some of the metrics that have been put out into the market, um, knowing that technology and digital has really impacted so many of the other functions in our lives, whether it's in banking, whether it's in childcare, whether there's so many aspects that digital has helped to make better and improve. I think we're just beginning that journey in healthcare. So looking at kind of consumer expectations, consumers recognize that technology is really important. Whether are we meeting kind of where patients are at, when we look at the number of lives that have been impacted and are impacted by digital therapeutics, this is huge growth within just one year. The amount of growth that's taking place in the market is really accelerating. And then when we think about where are providers at? Well, what we're seeing today through some of the research is that about 22% of providers are prescribing digital therapeutics, but there is a huge desire to figure out how do they uh, implement digital therapeutics into their flow and a willingness and openness to start to adopt some of these new tools that can help provide better quality outcomes. So if we go to the next slide, I would be happy to talk more about this in kind of the Q&A, but for us, as we think about kind of where can digital health really be leveraged, I think that it starts with the quality of care and being able to impact the quality metrics. I think it is about connecting those patients when they're not in clinic or in our facilities um, to their caregivers and to their providers and providing insights and, and, um, and data on, on that care and how that care is going. It's being able to think about kind of how do we escalate and de-escalate care pathways uh, appropriately and how do we reduce some of the barriers uh, to that access. We also, um, I think in conversations in most of the conversations that I've been in, there's a tendency to really focus on the reduction of unnecessary healthcare utilization. But I think it's also a conversation about, around appropriate healthcare utilization. And those two things always seem a little bit more distinct to me. As we think about some of these other metrics around um, adherence, uh, obviously those can be very condition uh, specific, whether we're talking about diabetes or whether we're talking about hypertension or asthma and COPD, that adherence can play a really meaningful role. And when we think about kind of what does this do for the quality of the life of the, of, of the patient, but also for their families. Um, and, and how does that impact those family routines? We can make a huge difference and ease the burden of living with a chronic condition uh, by a lot, by offering this kind of external support for the patients. And then it's about the right treatment at the right time. I think in 
asthma, one of the big conversations taking place right now is around biologics and the ability and to identify the right patients, for example, to move a patient from, um, from uh, more, more of an inhaler-based treatment to an injectable treatment and what does that pathway look like and, and what are the cost factors to be considered and who qualifies um, based on their adherence to the medications. These are insights that through passive sensors, we can really help facilitate and ease and make these informed clinical decisions. So with that, if we go to the next slide, I'm going to transition this over to Tracy to provide more of a uh, health systems perspective and an ACO perspective on, on digital health. Thank you, Sousa. Um, hello. As Garrett mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, my name is Tracy Chu. I am the Corporate Vice President of Population Health. Um, a little bit of my background, uh, I'm coming from the provider healthcare side, and my experience has really primarily been in the ambulatory space. I am an operator at heart. I have managed physician practices and medical groups in my career and have really focused primarily in the physician practice space. Um, to kind of continue with the cooking ingredient analogy that Susa started, uh, for the purposes of today's conversation, I am promoting myself to Chef Tracy. So from this point on, Garrett, I expect you to, um, to use that title for me. <laughs> um, but I will spend a few minutes today going to a little bit on the background of Scripps, how we really approach the um, baking of our quality cake, what ingredients we use, the prep required, our approach to making sure that it meets all the stakeholders' needs, and ultimately, whether or not it tastes good to the patient. And I think um, if we can go to the next slide, a little bit about Scripps, uh, just to give you a little context in terms of my background and then what I'm doing at Scripps. Scripps is a, uh, is a not-for-profit organization based out of San Diego, California. And you saw the prior slide, that is a real picture and that is a real beach at Scripps or at San Diego. Um, we're an integrated health system made up of five hospitals, 30 ambulatory clinics, we're responsible for about 3.8 billion in revenue. We have about 17,000 employees and about 3,500 um, affiliated providers in varying degrees. Um, as Susan mentioned in her comments, um, similar to Propeller, we really take a balanced approach in terms of how we evaluate interventions, digital technology, and anything we really do in the care space on that quintuple aim. So the enhancing the patient experience, improving population health, uh, reducing cost of care, improving provider and staff satisfaction, and making sure that we have an inclusive and equity approach to how we're performing our care. Um, so we'll kind of go through in future slides kind of how that actually results in the outcomes that we've been able to achieve with our quality measures. So next slide. Again, a little bit understanding in terms of the breadth of Scripps Health. Um, we do encompass the entire San Diego County. Um, we are an integrated, expansive delivery system, and you can kind of see a little bit of some of the services we provide. Next slide. So really in terms of digital health and journey, I'm going to speak at a broader level here. Um, we kind of talk about what is the suite of our digital interventions when it comes to patient care, and how do we go about selecting the digital interventions we will use at Scripps. Um, this slide kind of gives you a, a snapshot in terms of the various tools that we've been able to use over the years, really with the goal of improving access, convenience, patient and provider experience. Um, all these tools kind of are part of the mix of ingredients, if you will, combining with the strength of the patient and provider relationship. Um, and we're hoping this creates that delicious high quality cake that we're hoping to achieve with the patient. I will say that um, from a high level philosophical perspective, a lot of what we do in the ambulatory environment is really about ensuring that anything we do really protects that provider and um, patient relationship. We know that digital technology can never replace that. It should only enhance that and improve that. And so to the point, you know, to any intervention or any digital technology we, we incorporate into our workflows, we wanna make sure that, you know, I'll, I'll kind of list out kind of six great, you know, basic principles that we use as we evaluate our digital technology. One, we ground all of our interventions against that quintuple aim. How do we make it easier for our patients to access care? How do we make our provider and our staff um, easier to deliver that care? How do we create a, a environment that allows them to do that? Workflow integration number two can we integrate this into the workflow in a way that will either automate 
or reduce barriers or remove steps where we can. So an efficiency standpoint or improving the experience for the patient. Um, three, da data integration. We are very careful in terms of what we integrate into our EMR. This is not about everything going in. It's about being selective in what goes in, why it goes in, and how valuable it is in terms of data. Um, four is, is it simple and does it have a focused impact? Can we measure that? I think simplicity is key here. Oftentimes, you know, when organizations are selecting digital technology interventions, it can be a little bit too daunting and they try to do too much with it. So we try to keep it simple. Five, can we measure our success? Do we have process measures? Do we have outcome measures that really measure against the baseline so we can really determine whether or not this intervention is achieving what we're expecting it to achieve? And the last thing, and, the, and probably the, the infrastructure or the basis for all of this is to make it successful is do we have a governance structure and a management system that allows our stakeholders to be involved but also includes the um, organization's goals so that we have a matching between the two? Um, it is, and the thing here is that we always determine these projects and these interventions to be a patient project when we implement these. These are not IS projects. These are not financial projects. These are truly patient projects. And so we keep that always at the center of what we've done. So the bottom line here is that when we use technology in our workflows, we are very targeted in the use. We don't let the technology drive our strategy. So next slide, and we can go through a little bit more later in the Q&A if you have questions specific to any of those um, interventions that were listed on that slide. So this is really uh, what we, oh, I, sorry, I was, uh, can you go back to the patient care pathway slide? Yeah, there you go. So um, in terms of how we speak to implementing these digital t interventions, you know, again, keeping the patient at the center um, we do often continually ask ourselves, how do we make the health system easier to navigate and the population health and care programs we currently have easier for the patients to access? So we always do this by one, evaluating the current pathways. Um, are there barriers within that pathway, however small, that we can either automate or reduce or remove? Um, we keep our focus simple and we don't try to solve too many problems at once. The results that we've really been able to achieve really hit all those quintuple aim domains. We've been able to see improved engagement by our patients, and I can kind of give you some stats around that. We've been able to improve the workflows for our patients, our providers, and our staff. Um, we've been able to replace manual processes with automated ones. We've also been able to proactively target, communicate, and educate patients based on um, either their demographics or current um, risk stratifications. And then we've been able to identify populations that require that additional targeted approach. So those are kind of the, 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 grind, the grounding principles that we use as we try to integrate and implement any of our digital strategies into our workflows. So ultimately the resu results speak for themselves. If you can go to the next slide. Yep, there we go, that's the slide. Um, and you can see we have nine ambulatory quality measures. The first five are listed here. And these nine ambulatory quality measures that we track are cascaded from the board level at the Scripps Health Board all the way down to our front lines. It also includes our medical group members. And you know, these are the, the quality measures that really kind of hit the Venn diagram between what's important from their health plan perspective, what's important from our patient uh, population perspective, and you know, what's important to Scripps. The percentile benchmark that you're seeing here are measured against regional benchmarks. There are IHA, which is an integrated healthcare association that really measures the California performance across various health plans. Um, and so we benchmark our performance against that. And so you can see here that um, we're performing four out of the nine are at the 95th percentile and above. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that the remaining really, you know, kind of graduate down to the lowest at the 70th percentile. So I think the reason I'm bragging about scripts here is not because um, we do anything that we don't that we don't take care of our patients any better than anyone else. I believe that we really stay focused on making sure that that is at the center when we're measuring our performance and, and it results in outcomes. I think every organization is doing their best to try to make sure quality measurements and outcomes are, are 
visible and we are a benchmark against you know high performance but the key here for us is that we can't measure what we measure what matters and quality matters to our patients and to us so you know i can speak again to the kind of the performance and what we've done in each one of these domains as we get into the q a but i want to at least give you a, a perspective from a organization or a healthcare system in terms of how we approach digital technology on a broader scale. And then we can speak a little bit to the specific interventions um, in the Q&A. So next slide. So really this, this slide really just kind of summarizes a little bit of some of the, the questions that we've been able to tee up during this conversation. I'm sure there's many more. Happy to go through any of the details or any further questions the audience may have, but wanted to give you at least a broad understanding of Scripps Health and what we've been able to achieve with our quality measures. So Garrett, I will hand this back to you to kind of move us into the Q&A. All right, wonderful. Um, well, we do have some uh, questions that have come in. So in no particular order, we'll get to these. By the way, if you do have a question that you would like to um, ask one of our speakers, one or both, uh, go ahead and submit it now using your control module. Uh, there's a little questions tab there, and then we're gonna get to as many of them as we can, but don't worry, we'll, we'll someone will reach out to you uh, with an answer if we're not uh, able to get to yours. But let's go ahead and, and, and dive in here. Uh, First question is, what advice would you give to those who are considering integrating digital health solutions into their organizations to improve quality measures and achieve better patient outcomes? Do you want me to take this first, Susa, or do you want? I'll take that one, and then I'll go second. Sure. I think um, I'll go back to what I reiterated during my conversation. I think oftentimes organizations try to do too much with digital technology, and they try to solve too many problems. And I think what's really important is be very targeted and careful in terms of what solution you're targeting for what problem. Um, when we do that, and we've really been focused on, you know, either looking at the workflow in general to say, here is a huge barrier that we need to find a solution for, or if we come up with a potential uh, digital technology that we want to explore and we say, okay, how would this, where would this most appropriately impact our workflow? We go into it not trying to solve too many problems. And I think that's really important. We are a lean organization. We approach all of our problem solving with this lean mentality of what's the real problem we're trying to solve, and then understanding the current performance to our targeted performance, identifying those gaps, and then very carefully determining which countermeasures would appropriately address those gaps. If you go about it with that kind of disciplined approach, and you make sure that there's stakeholder involvement. The other piece here, and I, I'm gonna emphasize this over and over, is a governance structure. You've got to have a very tight governance structure that ties in the C-level suite all the way down to the front lines. You cannot have the front lines driving the strategy on digital technology. You can't also have the C-suite driving the technology in totality. They have to be, it has to be a match. So a description I've always used is in terms of what my role is, is I'm a matchmaker. I have to figure out what really is the organization strategy at the high level and match it to what's going to impact at the front lines. And where there's a match, that's where we're gonna to continue to iterate and improve um, with our digital technology interventions. And you know the quintuple aim as kind of that, that true north really helps ground all of our decisions because you can't do an intervention, you can't integrate anything make, without making sure all five of those areas are being addressed. And if, if you're missing two or three of those areas, then you have to start to question whether or not this is the right thing for the organization. If you're only doing it for patients, if you're uh, their workflow, if you're only doing it for the provider satisfaction, if you're only doing it for financial reasons, then you know, stop and pause and question whether or not this is the right thing to do right now. It may be something you want to do organizationally because it's it's you know required, but you really should find a way to make sure that it has a broader impact across broader stakeholders. That would be my advice. <laughs> See that? Good advice. Um, I I was thinking about the same thing, and I I'll, I'll actually um, 
emphasize, I think, Tracy, what you said is that alignment between, so coming at it both having been on the insurance side for a long time and working with many vendors like myself now, um, having that alignment and direction be driven by the C-suite, but having the frontliners who are actually implementing these flows, is, it's important to have that line across the board. Without that, it's very difficult to gain the momentum. Um, and what I've seen over the last five or six years now is that we, we as a healthcare system are keen to pilot things and do things in low risk modality, but it is an incredible amount of resources and investment, even when you put a pilot off the ground. And I think more and more now when I'm talking with health systems, they're less interested in piloting and more interested in, in understanding that they may not get the results in year one, not maybe even in year two, that the implementation and adoption takes time. I think for a while there was a perception that digital therapeutics would come and suddenly there would be a, a complete shift in how things work. But we as humans, we have to acclimate and patients have to acclimate to using new tools. Providers have to acclimate to using new tools. So I, I think in the end, I would really find out organizationally where is the appetite and is this going to be something that you want to pilot and be thoughtful about the resources and integration level that you want to do when you're just doing a doing a pilot versus are you as an organization ready to really make the investment and look at it as a journey and an opportunity to learn. Some of the systems that we work with, there's a really big difference when someone's doing a digital health solution for the first time and with us versus when I'm coming in and doing a digital health solution with a company that's done six or seven or eight of these before us. And, and so we see that kind of difference in, in kind of readiness, ability to take on the risk, understanding kind of longitudinal commitment versus wanting to just do a short, quick test of a solution. Um, and, and so those would be things that I would, I would make sure that there's alignment across the organization on what is it that we're doing and what is the appetite that we're willing to take a risk on. And where I see some of the influence coming directly from is, is a lot of the quintuple aims that we talked about today, but is it going to make a clinical difference? Is it gonna make a difference to provide our workflow? And, and what's, is it a negative workflow impact or, a, or is it going to increase the burden on providers? Um, some of these solutions um, are able to help prioritize populations like I was talking about before and identify the patients who are at highest risk using these digital solutions and thereby really helping target the provider time towards those individuals who are representing higher risk, and that can be a workflow savings net net. Um, and then there's the, obviously the financial impact of the organization and making it sustainable. It's one thing to kind of gain an innovation budget where you're testing something out for a year or two, but how, how will your organization make some of the adoption of these digital health solutions more permanent and sustainable? as an ACO and entering into what Tracy was sharing with you guys as a standard around um, ha working with partners who have enough evidence to go into risk sharing arrangements or value-based arrangements, or is there a remote monitoring code or other things in a more traditional fee-for-service environment that can, can help support it? Because as Tracy said, the goal is to support the patient. The next level is kind of what's the structure of the contracts that they, they are serviced under. But we want to be able to look at these patients holistically. And I think having that understanding of how does it bridge in your organization and, and how does it create a sustained environment is really important. Um, so those would be some of the tipping points that I'd start with and, and want to try to gain alignment um, across the organization on. All right. Well, that was a very thorough answer from both of you. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, all right, next question here is, uh, what future developments or trends do you anticipate in the field of digital health that will further support healthcare organizations in their pursuit of high quality care and improved patient outcomes? So I can tell you that right now at Scripps, there's a lot, and I think nationally, um, there's a lot of discussion about AI, a lot of discussion about how that's going to be integrated, how we're gonna use that. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of unknowns around that. And I think that is one that we're going to keep an eye on. I think if you saw on that one slide where it kind of shows a suite of all of our digital um, 
options. We are under evaluation right now of looking at some of the AI work under the chat, the chat GPT and whether or not it can help some of our nursing support, our triage, um, our um, kind of our, our nurses in general. And so that's something that I think is, is right now very early on in the phase. We ta I talked about this um, in a prior discussion about you know, what's the challenge with AI? And I think organizations are a little bit fearful in terms of, is this going to replace the clinician's critical thinking and their decision-making? And how do you integrate this in a way that's responsible? And I think that's one of the things that we'll continue to you know, work with in terms of a governance structure and what, is, um, what are we using in terms of AI? What do, we, what do we share with the patient if we're using it? How do we make sure that it's not, again, a replacement of the provider and the patient relationship, but really complements it and supports it? So um, there's, there's a lot there. I think that's one of the newer technologies that continues to be out there that everyone's talking about and there's a lot of discussion on, but not a whole lot of there there yet. I think uh, what I love, um, Tracy, is kind of how you just brought it right back to being an ingredient of that care and how AI and ML, I think, are going to continue to be ingredients, but it would be hard to see it completely replacing that care, care continuum. I think for, um, I think for me, they're, they're probably one that's less less visible, but I think really important is that seeing how we can integrate information and facilitate the simplicity of the digital experience, both for patients. I mean, I probably have over, over 30 apps on my phone, but realistically, I only probably use eight of them on any given day. And I think about our patients when they have one for one health system, another app for another health system, then they have their wellness apps, and then they have their digital therapeutic apps. I think we're going to start to see the pressure mounting to create more cohesive experiences for these patients, not just within a condition, but across conditions. As we know, most of our patients have more than one condition. And I think we'll see some quiet innovation happening there. It won't be kind of that big big next thing, kind of the way that we think of AI and ML. But I think as we start to crack that nut, not just for the patients, but providers through these EHRs that are able to more, more and more simply integrate data from third parties, we'll start to see that having a greater and greater impact on, on the adoption of digital. I think the other is that similar to Tracy, but from a slightly different angle, is that for a digital therapeutics company like ours, we think about how can we use AI and ML to accelerate prediction um, in a very thoughtful, privacy-centric uh, way. But the idea that you can bring environmental data like poll and count together with um, patients taking medications in certain geolocations and be able to actually start building predictive algorithms, which we've now done, and be able to then it's let a patient know, hey, today it looks like it's going to be a tough day out there in, in, in Los Angeles based on wildfires and other things. Might be, might be a day to make sure you're taking your rescue medication or you're taking a double dose in the morning before you leave. Um, and, and so when you, we can start to really focus on that predict and prevent, I'm really excited about what AI and machine learning can do there. But similarly to Tracy, I'm very concerned about kind of how do we do that in a way that um, is thoughtful, is an added ingredient, and we aren't over-reliant on, on that to solve too many things all at once. So lots, lots of think on it, but those I think are, I like the idea of there are very big shiny toys emerging in the market, but I also think that there are these huge blocks of innovation around um, simplifying this digital ecosystem for patients and providers that, that when we crack that nut, I think it's gonna unlock a lot in the market. It, just might not be seen as the big shiny toy um, next big thing on the horizon. Okay, very good. Uh, next question here is, how do you ensure the interoperability and seamless integration of digital health tools with existing healthcare systems and workflows for all optimal efficiency and effectiveness? Oh, Tracy, I'll let you take this one. You've probably experienced it a couple of times, but then I'll, well, I'll I mean, answer what it's like on our side, too. 
I, I think I'm going to go back to what I emphasized initially, which is don't try to bring everything into your EMR. Don't try to overload the data with just a bunch of noise. Um, but how do you integrate it seamlessly so the important information gets into the right, um, it gets in front of the right people? Meaning, are you providing information on an RPM, you know, a remote patient monitoring device that's critical to, for the provider to actually make decisions on, in terms of care for that patient? Or are you just flooding it with more um, data that's not relevant? And so being very thoughtful. I mean, I think a lot of times when you embark in a lot of these digital technology tools, there's this, there's this initial thinking that you have to bring everything into the EMR, which then obviously explodes the cost of the implementation. It, it extends the timeline and it makes it just way more overly complex than necessary. So the, the key here is again, the simplicity of truly get down to what is needed and how do you make sure that is integrated and seamless? And those problems that you're solving that's based on what is must to have versus a nice to have changes, changes the dynamic in terms of how you're actually integrating that technology into your workflows and into your system. So I think it's really, you know, I continue to go, go back to being disciplined in what problem are you trying to solve? Because if you really stay focused on that, it will reduce a lot of the noise that can, can create that paralysis analysis that, that happens when you see a shiny new toy, when you see a technology that you're like, oh, I wanna do that. It promises me all these things. But the question is, is what it's promising, is it really gonna solve a problem that you actually have? Or is it just fun to do because it looks exciting? So I think we all get kind of tired sometimes of just doing the day-to-day -day healthcare grind as organizations. And so we like to do shiny new toys. We like to work on shiny new toys. Um, the, what I always tell my team is that it's great if it's shiny and it's new, but it also has to be a value to the organization, to the patient and to our clinicians. And what problem are you really trying to solve with this? So um, I sound like a broken record and I know my team tells me I sound like a broken record, but it's true. You gotta stay really kind of focused on the core values of why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and then making sure that that integrates seamlessly. And be surprised at how little information needs to actually be integrated into your system in order for it to have a value add. And so let more is not always better. And I think that's really the, the message I would probably want to send when you're thinking about how to seamlessly integrate it into the workflows. And just from a general understanding of just how workflows happen. And, you know, I think it's always a good exercise every year to map out your workflows, your current workflows in whatever area and have your teams identify the barriers that cause them the biggest headaches. It, you may not have a solution for everyone, but as, as these technologies come up, as there are new you know, things that, that come across your, your plate in terms of an opportunity to integrate a digital intervention, you can look at that and you can say, oh, is there a problem here that this could potentially solve? I already have my suite of problems that I know are barriers. Now it's about that matchmaking. So again, it goes, I'm the matchmaker. That's all I do all day long is match make, you know, what somebody wants versus what somebody, you know, what somebody else has. And we figure out how to make that work. And does it really ultimately support the patient care? So I know I sound a little bit redundant. I'm sorry if I do, but I'm an operator at heart and I'm not just about doing stuff for the sake of doing it. I also, you know, I believe in results. I believe in, um, in getting stuff done and, the only way to do that is if you have a really clear understanding of, of the decision-making process to do that. I'm gonna answer it similarly, but maybe differently. We've done about 80 contracts like this in, in, in the life of Propeller. And in looking back and thinking about what's been the number one reason that we've succeeded with some organizations and not had successful growth with other organizations. And there's one single ingredient that comes across every time. And this is so really what you just said, but it's getting to early results quickly without a ton of barriers. 
if you have the longer it takes you to implement so if the implementation pathway is a year for example that's a long time to gain sustained momentum and prioritization through an organization if you can get off the first three months and show results that patient lives are changing provider lives are changing and it's easier to manage these patient populations you start to build the appetite and the desire within the organization for more and more people to have tools. And so thinking about how do you want to spearhead this? What's the fastest way that you can start to gain some momentum and wins and, and gain that buy-in? And, and then that kind of speaks to, do you actually want to launch fully integrated first or do you want to do a light integration first and then deepen that over time and to Tracy's point, what's the most important functions that you have to have? For us, the most frequent requests that we get is, can I enroll a patient very quickly through just a couple of clicks into a digital therapeutic program? Or is it going to take me 15 minutes to get them enrolled through 27 screens on, on my EMR, EHR system? I can tell you 27 screens later, very few people make it all the way to the end. So usually the answer is, how can I enroll them with just a couple of clicks? Two is once I've enrolled them, can I get support? I have limited time to be with my patient and I wanna focus it really on that patient and the care of that patient. I want them to know that they have this program and they have the support tool, but how, who picks up the pieces after that? And how does that, how does a patient get the digital device or the digital download? And who spends that extra minute explaining to them the value that they get from it? Um, and then the third is when you're returning, once a patient is enrolled, we still got to have the provider satisfaction of it's not just that the patient gets something, but that the provider gets something for their effort. And being able to close that loop with that data coming in. And for example, now being able to say, I have 20 patients who are on a digital, digital connected device. Now, whether it's diabetes and you're looking at continuous glucose monitor data or whether it's propeller and you're looking at COPD and asthma inhalation data, being able to say, hey, these patients aren't doing well and are at highest risk, and here are some things that we could do to help them out. Those kinds of insight, not just pushing data to the providers, but focusing those few nuggets that you want to integrate back into your EHR to be really meaningful insights that allow the physician to take the next or the clinician to take the next steps. Those would be some of the things that I would highlight, but it, it gets to what Tracy's saying is, this is tactical and it comes down not just to these high level lofty ideas of digital health, but really the grit of how do you make, make it happen and how do you then get to those clinical and quality outcomes quickly so that you can reinforce the adoption of a digital therapeutic in your organization. Eric, can I just jump in here really quickly? Because I think um, I want to add a little bit to what Susan is saying is what I have seen too, what that a lot of organizations do um, is they just measure the outcome. And they 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 have KPIs that are really just outcome based, which is ultimately I want to have all of my you know high level diabetic risk patients you know drop down to a, a moderate level of risk. But that lead time to measure that is could be years. You know I want to see total cost of care drop down X percent. Again, lead time on that can be years. So what we do is we have an overall outcome measure that we focus on. But we also have to, you have to develop process measures. What are the key critical processes that you have to measure every day on a daily basis within your front lines that you know are going to move that dial towards that outcome? And so the, the combination of process measures and outcome measures has to be part of it. It allows the teams to be engaged on a daily basis. And it also allows you to know directionally that you're on track. Because the last thing you want to do is measure total cost of care, come to find out two years later it didn't do it. And you spent all these this time, resources, and money um, on something that wasn't moving the dial. So, you know, part of this, if you're really thinking about integrating a solution, is making sure that you have really defined process measures and outcome measures so that you can keep that engagement and know directionally that you're moving in the in the right direction so. awesome I thousand percent agree with that i think that is really important and it's very 
it goes to back to the difference of if you're doing a pilot and you're expecting the top pilot within a year or six months to yield total cost of care results, that would be hard. So what are the other markers that you want to use to think about? Or do you or is the organization ready to make the three-year journey investment? I, on the payer side, I always smile because it took us three years typically to really believe new solutions and believe the being from an actuarial perspective and to be able to design new benefit designs based on the data that was coming in from new solutions emerging in the market. And, and it's interesting now being on this side of the fence and seeing the same thing is true that when you're truly invested in doing this, recognizing that there's milestone markers that you can hold companies accountable for, but there is um, ultimately you want to be able to pace yourself to those true outcomes. Um, and every every month that you wait and you get started a little bit later, it's just another year from the back end in terms of when you can actually get those results achieved. Yeah, great. <clears throat> yeah, very good. There's a lot there, uh, obviously. Uh, this next question is for uh, Chef Tracy. Thank and, you. Uh, well played, Garrett. <laughs> Yes, uh, and this question is about, uh, it says, uh, the Scripps Patient uh, Care Pathways mentions referrals to VBC prefer preferred vendors. Yep. How are these vendors identified and or are they part of your stakeholder engagement in digital health? Well, I think it, it depends on the contract we're talking about. So for the, for the ACO, for their Medicare Shared Savings Program, you know, we've got preferred SNF vendors, for instance. That are, um, that are part of our network. Um, we've obviously got a network of providers within the ACO network that we wanna make sure um, are identified as part of the referral process. Um, so depending on the actual health plan or the contract itself, we build that into our decision-making. So we have Epic, we're an Epic shop, and we build a lot of that into the referral process and what is kind of a preferred you know, specialists, for instance, for that patient's specific contract and who is not. Um, so the, the thing that we've tried to do, because it can be very confusing, and, and providers, as you guys all know, the providers don't make decisions based on a patient's, you know, health plan or insurance. They don't, and they never should. And so what we need to do is make that a easy process for them. So if they're, if they're referring to, you know, ophthalmology, what they don't want to, we, what we don't want to create is such a difficult time selecting the appropriate ophthalmology um, specialist to send that patient to. So we try to make that an easy process within the system for them to easily identify who is in network based on or who has, has better quality outcomes that we want to see um, receive that patient. So it's about building that back end decision making support that allows the provider to do their job really easily and not kind of put that burden of decision making on them. And I think that's key. Um, I don't know if that answers your question completely, but referrals is a big one for us. The other thing that we've been working on directly with a lot of our payers is, you know, as again, most of you who are our operators are out there know the referral process for every health plan is very cumbersome. Whether it's a fee for service plan or whether it's a managed care plan, you know, putting in and submitting the referral, making sure it gets a turnaround time. It's a lot of it's manual. A lot of it does not integrate directly into your EMR. And so working with a lot of the plans to say, what are the steps so that I don't have to have a human fax machine basically taking information from my EMR to your um, uh, plans portal, submit the referral, wait for the results, then submit back into the EMR the results is something that we've been trying to do because we're not making it very easy for us either to process that patient through the system. So that's something that we continue to look at when we look at referral processing. So it's a, it's a front end referral decision making on the provider side the, and building the back end tools as well as the actual process itself to move the referral through the system. Yeah, great, great uh, uh, answer uh, to that. Um, unfortunately, that is all the time we have. I know the time went by pretty fast, um, and I know there's a lot more to be discussed. So who knows? Maybe we'll do a part two at some point. 
Um, but uh, as we close out, first of all, I wanted to thank you, Susa and Tracy, uh, for a wonderful presentation. There was, um, I, I know I learned a lot. I, I'm sure a lot of you did as well. Uh, real quick, as we close, I wanted to encourage you all to stop by vbcexhibithall.com and this is and visit the Propeller Health uh, virtual exhibit booth there. And that's kind of a living, breathing um landing page to where you can find out all the things that propeller health is doing in the virtual uh, i'm sorry in the value-based care space There's a lot of resources there and information and that way you can really educate yourself on on them and their solutions uh and then finally uh if you would like to uh, reach out to uh, our speakers or the propeller team uh their information is here on the screen and or you can feel free to reach out to me as well i'm happy to facilitate an introduction but uh, i wanted to thank you again everyone who came uh for joining us today in the summer it's hot and there's travel and a lot of distractions so thank you so much for being here we hope to see you next time have a wonderful rest of your days thanks everyone thank you. Thank you, Kara. All right, goodbye